It's finally here. You've got questions, we've got answers. We're excited to bring you our very first Q&A video. Stay tuned as we answer all the questions about transportation, how we pack, accommodations, health insurance, uh, saving money, <laughs> and a lot of other topics. Welcome back to Find Gina Marie, where we share our lives as full-time travelers and the connections we make along the way. If you're new here, welcome. I'm Judy. And I'm Kevin. All right, let's jump in with the questions. So the first one is from Rebecca W. And there's a bunch of questions, so we're going to go through as many of hers as we can. And the first... Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> Her first question is, do you fly, train, bus, or ship it to shift from one location to the next? And we do an assortment of things depending on where we are. Rarely going on ship, but a lot of planes because some of our countries aren't close together. And what's our favorite transportation? Train. And why? <laughs> <laughs> Mostly because it's easy. You don't have to be at a train station three hours in advance. Right. You don't have to worry about luggage weights or getting an overhead bin. So it's typically the easiest way for us to travel. Much more casual, much quicker. And like Judy said, less hassle when you have to show up and go through all that weighing process. We probably travel by bus one of the least ways. Yeah. And that's primarily because I think sometimes bus systems aren't always as reliable. Yeah, we'll take buses as public transport in a city. But going from city to city, when you're on a bus, now you're relying on the road system and, and any delays that happen there or bathroom stops maybe if the bus doesn't have a bathroom on it. Trains are just easier. If we're if we're able to take them, we certainly do. Right. In fact, when we were in Japan, they had a thing that if you were carrying big luggage, yeah. that they didn't want you to be on the bus at all. Yeah. And so we've done it in Cyprus, right. and it's worked out okay. It's just not our first um, method. And also, we have tried ferries on occasion, but it just hasn't worked out because of the time of year, one thing or another. But that's like a very good idea to us. Yeah, and we did take a train on a ferry, so that was our... <laughs> so if you check out our uh, uh, Palermo video, that's uh, that's actually the ferry. <laughs> yeah, from, from Naples to Palermo. Yeah. We aren't really cruise people per se. We did do a Nile River cruise, which right. isn't the same. It wasn't for the point of getting from point A to point B. It was more to see the sights along the way. Uh, but we've heard a lot of interesting things about repositioning cruises. And I think that's something that we may have somewhere in our future. I'm not sure in 2024 or not. We have a yeah. lot of great ideas and that may not fit. Yeah, we're still, I'm still on the fence about cruise ships in general because of the amount of time you spend packed in with other people and too many stories about people getting sick. So it's a little <laughs> eh for me. <laughs> All right, another one from Rebecca. When you fly, what class do you typically fly on longer haul flights? And how do you deal with discomfort on long flights? So we normally fly regular economy for the most part, but also because we're traveling full time, we don't have to do a lot of long haul flights. We typically try to use geographic arbitrage, which means that we try to make logical next steps that don't automatically send ac us across the world, unless we're going back to the U.S. to see family. Yeah. And so in and out of the U.S. is like most of the situation that would have us do something like that. We just kind of mentioned it in our last uh, Japan video, but we did fly premium economy on that flight. Yeah, that was just a little perk because we had some points saved up and figured, you know, this is going to be kind of this really intense trip. We'd like to start it off right and kind of a really chill flight. And that was, that was worth it. Most of the time we save money on booking the flight and then we may upgrade our seats on a flight uh, just to make sure that maybe if we can get two seats together instead of three, that's a great option. And most flights nowadays, unfortunately, you don't get away with a free seat. Right. Especially if you're flying to budget airlines. So we're always paying for some sort of seat in almost every flight. We try not to pay for luggage. Uh, if there's luggage that you can carry on for free or if there's luggage that you can uh, stow for free, you know, we do whatever the free process is as much as possible. We travel with a uh, carry-on and backpack apiece and our backpacks fit under the seat and our 
carry-on luggage is rolling and it's small enough to fit in the overhead bin. We don't carry anything else with us. We're not really taking up any extra space. Our under seat backpack is considered a personal item. Right. To her point about how do you deal with discomfort, I'll say that we always pack water bottles so we aren't relying on when we get a small little cup of water. <laughs> yeah. And we try to also bring snacks so that we're not hungry. Yeah, we have re reusable bottles that we try to fill in the airport before we, when we get past security and fill them up. Get on the plane, make sure we have that. And yeah, snacks are nice because sometimes the longer flights, it just, just don't know when the first meal's coming. <laughs> I bring compression socks that I wear uh, most of the time when I'm traveling longer distances, and that really helps just to kind of keep me from retaining too much water. I try to avoid too much salt when I'm traveling as well so that I don't have a lot of tightness in my joints or my fingers. That helps too. The hardest problem for me on planes is the pressure. You know, sometimes it makes my sinuses crazy, so... <laughs> That's why another reason trains are nice. There's no pressure on trains. The next question has to do with whether we have ever stayed in a hostel with a suite bathroom. Uh, en suite, I'm assuming. No, it's shared bathroom. Oh, you sure? Yep. Either way, no. <laughs> <laughs> we have not. Uh, well, we work in our Airbnb space and even in hotels sometimes, like in Japan, we had to stay in hotels it was a little hard. I mean, there wasn't really a, a couch set up. There wasn't a kitchen, so we weren't cooking. You know, the things we try to do when we're traveling is try to keep everything as low cost as possible. And if we can do stuff in our room, we do it. So a hostel means we just don't have the space to do the things that we normally do when we travel. We've also found that in some places, a hostel is not really any cheaper yeah, than some of the Airbnbs we've had. All right, another question. This one from Natasha T. Can you explain how you handle accommodations when you go back home? She's talking about when she goes back to California, friends may offer us to stay a few days, but it's difficult for us to change locations every couple of days. And with family, it can be hard as well without overstaying your welcome. I completely understand that. Uh, the last time we stayed for nine days in Airbnb, but it cost the same amount as a month. Would it be more affordable uh, would it be a more affordable country if you're staying with family, I guess, is the, is the main question. That's complex, right? Oh, sure. Well, we have exactly the same issues. Uh, when we go back to the United States, it's the most expensive time of our travels because in we, we're from San Francisco or we've spent the last 10 years there. And so that's what we consider home. When we visit, uh, the one thing going for it is that we don't have to rent a car, yes. but accommodations are usually pretty expensive. Every place else that we have family requires us to rent a car as well as rent some sort of accommodations. Yeah. Now, family does always offer just stay with us. And sometimes they really don't have the space for it and they're just being very nice. It's like, yeah, that's OK. You know, we have probably a lot of people to see. So going in and out of one family's home is a little trickier. Because we're doing so much in such a short amount of time, I think that we feel like that would add to the stress and tension yeah. of being back in the US. So it's probably better for everyone for us to kind of have our own space and then visit as much as we can. Because yeah. because we're moving so quickly, it's exhausting and super stressful. Yeah, so we, we do need some alone downtime. But we feel your pain. It's it's really a hard, hard thing. We also really are not fans of borrowing somebody's car. Oh. I feel like there's always something that could go wrong. We don't want to have the responsibility for it. So even though we, it's not fun to have to pay for the price of a car rental, yeah. we do it anyway. That's why we like San Francisco. No car rental. Okay, here's an anonymous question. Does weather or season of the year impact where and when you plan to travel somewhere? Yes, <laughs> because we found it's really hard, especially in places we didn't expect it to be hard, to be cold. Uh, Northern Italy, in a season that we thought, oh, it's going to be a little chilly, we were freezing. And we really didn't have the clothing for that time of year. So now we look very carefully at every place we're going, saying, what time of year is it? Is it rainy season? Is it cold? Is it extremely hot? We're looking for non-extremes whenever possible. Right. When we were in Greece, it wasn't freezing weather. It was in the low 50s when it was cold in yeah. January. And there were times when it was 
seasonably warm and we didn't even need a jacket. So that's kind of the range that we're looking for in what would typically be a cold weather season. But this year we opted to be in Southeast Asia so that we wouldn't have to deal with the extreme cold in other parts of the world, especially Europe, where there's not too many places where it's warm. Yeah, and Vietnam is not cold. We're <laughs> not freezing here. It's 88 degrees here today. Yeah. Dawn C is asking about travel insurance. She's traveling with her three kids between Italy, the Balkans, and England until they're settled in Verona. So she's researching options and would love any feedback. Yeah, travel insurance was something we had to talk about right away when we started traveling. And it's one of those things where do we really need it? Most of the countries we're in have great um, health care and it's usually more socialized than the U.S. So you've got options there, but for emergencies, for emergencies. But we thought, you know, we're going to get a plan and we researched it, got a Cigna health plan that's for travelers. Right. I think that we currently pay $5,751 a year. This policy restricts us on the amount of health care we get in the United States. So we can have three months in the U.S. needing health care. Um, and God forbid, let's say if we had cancer, if the cancer treatment took six months, it would cover it, but then it wouldn't cover beyond that. So You couldn't file another claim for another health problem. Right. They really don't want you to be in the U.S. for more than three months for routine or, you know, basic health care. Yeah. We'll leave a link in the description to uh, a little bit more about that policy and some details if you want to read, th read through them. And feel free to ask us any additional questions you have about it. But especially with children, I definitely think that you need to research it. And people who are younger will have lower premiums than we do. So that's a plus as well. <laughs> so back to Rebecca, we've got a question about your top 10 points to keep costs down. So forgive us as we look at our notes so that we can keep track of, of all 10. The first one is eat fewer meals, which I don't know, in some countries that works out really well because if we have a big meal during the day, that's all I need. You know, I, I need breakfast. I need some sort of maybe just coffee and even just a pastry, but then one big meal a day and normally I'm happy. Yep, completely agree. Number two would be to do grocery shopping and cook as many of your meals uh, from your Airbnb as possible. Now, there are exceptions to that. In Egypt, it was cheaper to eat out because shopping was a little more difficult and probably just as expensive as eating the meals that were local in the restaurants True. we could walk to. So we did eat at the local restaurants there and we did not cook in that kitchen, even though we had one. So look at the country that you're in. Some of them, it actually is cheaper to eat the local food. Number three would be to identify your priorities. So for us, Kevin really, really likes to go out and get a cappuccino. It's, it would it's, be- It's that lovely morning start that I need. You know, I don't ask for a lot, just, just a quiet morning and a cappuccino. And we do a lot of our planning and um, it's, it's just something that he really enjoys. Right. So if you're looking at your travel holistically, establish your own priorities and go from there. So for us, that's a priority that we try to accommodate. Mm -hmm. But it means that we may be eating cheaper meals when we do go out to eat otherwise, or we're cooking at home more, right. or we're doing things different on a daily basis to offset the cost of our breakfasts. Yeah. The reason we do some of the things we do is because this is our life now. You know, we're not paying rent in an apartment in San Francisco. We're not spending our days, you know, doing all the things that we used to do or buying things for a place that we live in. So the choice is we want to be happy with our travels. And so we give ourselves these couple things that make us happy because this is important. You got to enjoy this life. If, if we did this just because we were make maximum savings on money, it would be miserable. And I'm not set up to live like that. So this is the compromise we make. Number four, as we mentioned earlier, travel arbitrage, which means we are very careful about where we're going next from the country we're in. And we look at all the different prices for where we would go next. Can we do a train? Do we have to, have to take a flight? Is it a, an economy flight? You know, some of the flights are really cheap between countries. You can get a $25, $50 flight. Hey, let's do that. And number five is to slow travel. If you're going to spend a couple of weeks here and then move and a couple of weeks there and then move, 
all of those transportation costs really add up very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, also, because you're in an Airbnb for a month like we are, you actually almost get three or four days free, which makes things a lot more affordable. So uh, you get discounts for staying a week or for staying a month. And so we take advantage of that. And we're also not incurring all of those travel costs. Yeah. The idea is to not think like you're in vacation mode and you can save a lot of money by treating this as this is our lifestyle and we're going to keep things at a lower pace and not go on tours every day that we're in someplace. And number six, we try to offset our more expensive places like Japan with a cheaper place like Vietnam. <laughs> and if we can keep those so that we look at the overall year and say, okay, over the course of a year, we've stayed in some expensive places, but we balance those out with the cheaper ones. That really helps costs. Number seven would be to skip private tours. We do small group tours, but we limit how many of those even that we do. But if we're in a place for a month, we do try to get an, a tour early that's gonna show us around the city because we don't know what to go see, what, where to eat, where to hang out. And those kind of tours are fairly inexpensive. Oftentimes, we end up being the only couple on the tours. But we don't ever book we don't private book it tours. That way. No, we don't book it that way, but sometimes it just happens that way or we get another couple with us and they're really nice. And they kind of give you that overview and we, now we can live in this place for a while and really understand it better. Number eight, keep track of your spending. I take pictures of every receipt that we actually buy stuff for, breakfast, lunch, dinner, any kind of receipt is in our camera roll so we know exactly how much we're spending and we can keep track of it even if we can't do it in the moment we try to review everything and say you know we've been eating out a few times we need to find more foods to cook indoors or what whatever we can do to try to balance out those costs number nine is take good care of your health and that's trying to be mindful of what you're eating, making sure that you're getting in enough exercise, uh, going to the doctors, getting physicals. We're going to be in Thailand in a few months, and it's our intention to get some checkups checkups yeah. there. And when we were in Japan, we got new glasses, and got our eyes checked. So try to be doing the things that make sense to keep you healthy, because if you get sick, that's going to be really expensive and you want to avoid that at all costs. So be proactive with your health and you won't be paying a fortune down the road. Yeah. And sometimes you can get surgery in Serbia and save a little bit of money there. An episode <laughs> about that. It's in the description below. <laughs> Number 10. Be careful with the credit card you use. We worked really hard to find the best travel credit card we could. We used to use uh, mileage cards from airlines and then we were stuck with those airlines. Luckily, we switched before we started full-time travel because the Chase Sapphire reserve card for us covers everything. Like we don't have to worry about getting stuck with one airline or one way to travel. It's just collecting points and that's really helped us. And they do a pretty good job of not charging a lot of fees for the things that we use our card for. Especially foreign transaction fees, which can really add up when you're on the road full time. Right. And we have a couple of bonus tips that are very similar to each other. One is to book early. Make sure you have the biggest selection you can get for where you want to go and the time frame you want to go and the prices you want to go there with. And the other one is time of year, right? Shoulder season. That's our favorite time of year to go someplace. We don't always travel that way, but ideally when we can, we save a lot of money and we avoid crowds, which is wonderful. And if you choose a shoulder season versus a low season, it also means the weather's usually pretty decent and you're not really compromising very much. Yeah, no cold weather. We're not gonna, we're not gonna save money just by going someplace when it's the place you don't wanna be. <laughs> One point I will say is that if you want to be, let's say, in a beach town and there's probably not going to be a ton of things to do because the beaches are closed, some of those places will have a cooking class or something that you could learn or do that is maybe an unconventional thing that's less touristy, but is also a great way of spending time in that city or country. Oh, I can't go to the beach, so I'll cook. It sounds fun to me. <laughs> it does. <laughs> You don't have to do it, I will. <laughs> That's true. Another question from Rebecca. How do you keep track of your time in the EU and Schengen countries so you don't overstay your visa? Uh, we work really hard to make sure that when we're in Europe and we're in those Schengen countries, which is a subset of the European countries, that we are tracking every day and planning ahead 
not just tracking while we're there, but Judy, make sure that the spreadsheet shows every number of days. And then we have a Schengen app on our phones that we put it all in and make sure that those dates all align. We double check, triple check, because there is a big penalty if you overstay your 90 days. Huge penalty sometimes of you might not be able to get back in. And that would just totally ruin our whole lifestyle of traveling full time if we had to skip Europe. And just to clarify, there's not actually a visa you need right now. Uh, I believe that that's been delayed until 2025. But for now, it's just a matter of you're only allowed to be in Schengen countries for 90 days out of 180 days. We have a couple of videos. We've got a longer one that goes into a lot more detail. And then we have like a quick one minute video that explains it all. Yeah. I will say that we try not to stay a full 90 days. Uh, you need a you need a couple buffer days in there for sure because in case of flight gets canceled, which has happened to us, right? And you could get sick. Passport control does not care what your reason is. Yeah. They're not going to say, "Oh, poor you." Well, yeah. that's an extenuating circumstance. It's right. not at all. So you want to make sure that you give yourself that window of time that you can leave and still be safe. So Rebecca also asked about what we pack for clothes, personal hygiene and technology, and how we deal with significant temperature changes from one region without overpacking. First of all, we try to avoid extreme conditions. And by that, I mean that we were carrying gloves and hats. We pitched those Scarves. several months ago. Yeah, I had a um, scarf, got rid of that. And so as far as Kevin's concerned, we did buy a heavy winter coat for him that we got rid of in Brody Ferry, I believe. No, um, in, Italy, in Italy, when we realized we didn't have intentions to be in any cold weather climates for the next 12 months. Yeah, we got it in Italy when it was seriously cold. So we got it at half price. Wasn't a bad price considering how much we would have had to carry that around for the rest of our lives. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> no. We'll just buy another jacket if we go to this cold climate again and kind of balance things out that way. And his wasn't very packable. I have a puffy that does actually pack very nicely. Yeah. So I keep mine with me and I'll probably pick up a light scarf, a very light scarf to wear in temples and stuff like that in some of the warmer weather uh, places and probably a light wool so that it also keeps us warm. We've shifted over almost all of our clothes to wool, yeah. uh, in part because it they wash really well and um, they they're antimicrobial. Really well. Yes, they dry really well. Uh, there, there's so many benefits about them and yeah. we'll kind of talk about that um, in an upcoming episode because we are going to talk about uh, what we're traveling with now. We do have an older packing video from when we first started traveling mm -hmm. in January of this year, but we've changed around a lot of things that we were sure. traveling with. And as far as technology goes, we have camera co equipment. We have a lot of electronics that go along with it, two computers. I carry a lot of the camera equipment, in fact, all the camera equipment in my backpack. So that becomes the technology bag and that's really what it's for. And we got a few things hanging around outside of that, but pretty much I shove everything in there I can and just it's a little heavier than I'd like it to be because of that. But for an average person, um, we, yeah. we feel like we could travel with less if we weren't traveling full time. Another question from Natasha, what are your experiences with, with recycling so far? Do most countries, cities separate recyclables from trash? It's really a hit or miss thing. Um, some cities are really strict about it. You see information in the Airbnb, how to separate your stuff. Uh, very much the green bag, the gray bag, the black bag. Other countries, you don't even know. I mean, there's no signage or nothing. I will say that we have found that it does vary by where you are. Every city in Italy that we've been, except for Palermo, has had robust recycling, but Sicily had none, and Egypt had none, and Serbia had none. It depends, but most every country we have been in otherwise in Europe have all had recycling in yeah. the cities that we've visited. Some are more explicit about it than others. So sometimes we have to do a little bit of research. Is there a recycling spot local to our apartment, even if it doesn't say something in the apartment? Yeah, we always ask our Airbnb as well. Yeah. We got this anonymous question and I loved it so much that I went ahead and wrote a blog post about it. It says, we've been watching packing videos and are wondering if there's anything special you bring that's typically missing to Airbnbs. And can you give us an idea of what you cook? I have a, 
an article that's basically eat like a local and you can find it on our website at findinggenamarie.com. I think it's under full-time travel. And our last anonymous question is, uh, what do you do about getting mail on the road? We were really worried about this when we left San Francisco. There certainly is a lot of mail coming when you live someplace for a while. And we found a lot of services out there that would actually take your mail and scan it. We chose Traveling Mailbox as our service, mainly because of cost. It was one of the cheapest, $15 a month. We get to see all our mail that gets scanned. If it's junk mail, we don't pay for it. We just mark it as junk. And if it's something really important, something critical that we need, we can actually have it forwarded to us on the road or a family member. And they'll also forward checks. So we've had some government refund checks from taxes and stuff like that that actually gets sent to the bank via this service and it just gets deposited, which is the most important stuff. I want the refunds <laughs> in the bank. Especially since I'm applying for dual citizenship and there's a lot of really sensitive uh, paperwork, paperwork that's yeah. taken months and months and months to get to me and I wanna make sure that I do have them in hand. We hope you enjoyed this video. We hope the questions and answers were helpful to you. If we missed anything, please let us know in the comments. We need no more questions for the next Q&A video. Please give us a like, pass this on to a friend or family that you think would enjoy it, and subscribe if you haven't already. And check out findinggenuinery.com where you can get more information about our channel and the articles Judy's talking about. Until next time. Until next time.